Um, welcome everybody to this afternoon's webinar. My name is Jill Bristow. I'm from the School of Geography and Planning at Cardiff University and it's my great pleasure to chair this afternoon's webinar. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I'd just like to say a little bit about the Regional Studies Association who've organised and are hosting this afternoon's um, webinar. As you all, all probably know, the RSA is the global and interdisciplinary network for urban and regional research development and policy and has done tremendous work and continues to do tremendous work to support its members with the latest research and, and funding schemes um, with networking and publishing opportunities uh, and the space to grow research and careers. And, and one particular response that RSA has introduced in response to the current crisis is to put in place initiatives to support um, its members in the wider community with in initiatives such as this, the Region and Cities Industry Webinar Series, um, which has provided monthly sessions by experts in the fields of regional studies, science, planning or policy. Um, there are other initiatives as well um, hosted by RSA, so please do take a look at the RSA website um, for more information. But to today's session then, it's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce um, some stellar speakers who are going to speak about their new book um, on the levelling up agenda, clearly a very contemporary and important um, uh, agenda and we're very much looking forward to hearing um, what they have to say. Um, so I'll introduce each speaker briefly and then we'll, I'll, I'll hand over to them. They will speak for around seven to eight minutes each, so we should have about 40 minutes or so um, to hear about the book and then there'll be an opportunity for you to participate to ask questions and put them to the panel and I'll keep an eye on the Q&A and feed questions through through to our speakers so that should take us hopefully to about um, 3 30 this afternoon. So without further ado our, our speakers we'll begin with um, Ron Martin who's an Emeritus Professor of Economic Geography at the University of Cambridge and Emeritus Professorial Fellow of St Catharines College Cambridge. From 2015 to 2020, Ron was president of the Regional Studies Association and is also a research associate of the Centre for Business Research um, Judge Business School and a research associate of the Bennett Institute of Public Policy, both at the University of Cambridge. Um, Ron has published uh, an enormous amount, has been obviously a, a key contributor to current and contemporary debates around regional studies, publishing more than 25 books, some 275 uh, journal papers on economic geography, regional and urban development, and the economic resilience of, of regions and cities, amongst other topics. He's undertaken research for the European Commission, for the OECD, for UK governments and a range of national and regional institutions, and is a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences and a fellow of the British Academy. After Ron, we'll hear from Peter Sunley. Peter is Professor of Economic Geography at the University of Southampton, and Pete's research has focused on the geographies of labour and labour market policy, business clusters and venture capital, design and creative industries, also urban development and resilience, and manufacturing in industrial regions. And Pete's a member of the research committee of the RSA and a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences. Also speaking today, we have Pete Tyler, who's Emeritus Professor of Urban and Regional Economics at the University of Cambridge and Emeritus Professorial Fellow of St Catharines College, Cambridge. Pete's interests in terms of research cover the economics of regions and cities, of regional policy and urban planning, with a particular focus on public policy impacts. And Pete's directed over 70 regional and urban research projects for the UK government, many of which have involved the evaluation of our flagship policy programmes. Following Pete, we'll hear from Andy Pike. Andy is the Henry Daesh Professor of Regional Development Studies at Newcastle University. And from 2012 to 2017, he was Director of the Centre for Urban and Regional Development Studies, Kurds, at Newcastle. Andy's research interests, publications and research projects 
are focused on the geographical political economy of local, regional and urban development and policy. And Andy's taken a undertaken a range of research projects for major international organisations such as the OECD, uh, UN, ILO, the European Commission um, and UK government. And then last but not least, we'll also hear from Ben Gardner, Ben is a director and chief operating officer of Cambridge Econometrics and holds a doctorate in economic geography from the University of Cambridge. Uh, Ben's interests are focused on regional and city economic growth across Europe, um, also regional productivity and the economic resilience of regions and cities. And Ben's been involved with several ESRC projects on the issues around regional and city economic growth and transformation. And uh, for several years, Ben was a research associate in the Department of Geography at the University of Cambridge, as well as working for the European Commission on their regional uh, work on co cohesion funds. So I'd like to now, I think, ask, I think, Ben to share the, his, his screen and uh, share the presentation. And I, I think I will now hand over to, to Ron to start the presentation. Okay, thanks very much indeed, <clears throat> Gillian, for that, um, that very, um, very fulsome introduction. Uh, welcome everybody to this uh, seminar or webinar on the, uh, the policy book that we've recently published with the RSA on levelling up left behind places, uh, the scale and nature of the economic and policy challenge. Ben, next slide, please. What we're going to do is, is divide this, in, this talk into uh, five sections, which are roughly uh, the sections in the book, apart from the last one, which is something we've added for today's seminar. Um, we're going to sort of divide this between ourselves, as Julian says, although I think Peter suddenly at the moment is having technical difficulties joining the, the seminar, so it may well be that I'll have to step up to the plate and uh, give his particular section. Perhaps we could then move off to the introduction. The problem of left behind places. Ben, please. <clears throat> now, as we all know, spatial inequalities, regional and urban inequalities, and economic prosperity and performance have increased across almost all of the OECD countries in recent decades. I think the OECD claims that uh, if you take the difference between the top 10% and the bottom 75%, that inequality has increased by more than 60% on average across the OECD countries over the last two or three decades. And what we've found in most countries is of course that certain regions and particular cities have aggressively steamed ahead of the rest. And many of those of the rest have really fallen progressively behind. And it's that particular group that we want to focus on today and we, indeed we focus on in the book. And these, these particular places, these left behind places are of particular significance. It's not simply that they have lower levels of, of economic prosperity and opportunity, but that's translated in many instances to uh, lower productivity, which is, of course, a major problem that confronts most of the advanced economies at the current time. And moreover, it translates to a certain extent into the, the uprising of political and social discontent over the last decade or so. Uh, which can be observed in most of the advanced economies from the USA through the UK to many parts of Europe, of course, and indeed beyond. So there's both a, so a social and political aspect to the left behind problem. Now, at the current time, of course, most countries in the OECD is again written about this, is that most countries are trying to build back better, build back fairer from the enormous economic effects of the current COVID pandemic, with some of the historic that some of the declines in economic prosperity following the, the pandemic have been historic proportions. And levelling up or, or trying to reduce economic disparities between places has been part of that aim. Now in the book, and indeed today, we're going to focus on the UK as a leading example of both the problem and the policy challenge. And the reason for that is not only do we know more about the UK as a group of researchers, but the UK has got one of the worst levels of, of uh, regional equality amongst the OECD countries. It also has one of the longest histories of, of regional policy going right back to the 1920s. So it's a particularly interesting case to examine. Thanks, Pete. Uh, sorry, Ben, for the next uh, slide, please. A couple of slides here which demonstrate this on the left hand side for the UK and the right hand side for the US. And they plot for both the standard regions and local authority districts in the UK and the states 
and the 370 metro areas of the United States, they plot per capita GVA in the first instance and per capita income in the second over this period 71 to 2018. And they use the coefficient of uh, variation. So it's standardized for the changing levels of national prosperity. And you can see quite clearly there that there was what's called a convergence up until the early to the late, middle to late 1980s. And since then, there's been this widening uh, disparity, a very upward sharp sort of movement in the curve that the, uh, the trend curves you can see there. So it's a problem which affects the United States. It's a problem that affects the UK. And indeed, we can have similar graphs for most of the other OECD countries. Next slide, please, Ben. Now, in the UK case, um, the problem is not a new one in many ways, because, and here's an historical table here, back to 1911, right through to 2018, various snapshots. And these are per capita GDP as a proportion of the GB total, or after 1971, the UK total. And you can see here, again, how we've got a rising level of variation or disparity over this time. That's the last row in the table. And the top two rows give you the sort of way in which this London and the Southeast regions together, and particularly London, have really progressively pulled ahead. And particularly since around about 1971 or 1981, you can see it powering away, um, leaving the rest of the country in many ways uh, increasingly behind. Next slide, please, Ben. But it's not just a regional problem. <clears throat> One can drill down. This is what much of the book is about. We can drill right down to the more local level. And these are the 372 local authority districts that could comprise Great Britain. We don't have consistent data for Northern Ireland, unfortunately. And these are quartiles of the differential growth over 81, 2018, of employment left-hand side and of GBA in the right-hand side. And what these two maps really demonstrate is that there is a sort of regional dimension to this. You can see many, indeed most of the, the high growth areas are in the sort of southern, southeastern part of the UK, but with interesting outliers in the north. But you can also see that it's a very patchwork pattern. So even parts of the south and, the, and southeast areas, which at that broad level appear to do very, very well, if you drill down to the local level, you can see this sort of archipelago or patchwork of, of local disparities. So when we get down to this level, you really are picking up individual city areas, localities, and so on, towns, and the way in which there's been really a differential performance over this particular period. And the dark blues are the, the areas that have been really sort of the worst 25%, the bottom quartile, which would be increasingly sort of growing far slower than the national economy. The dark red, are the areas which have really been pulling away in, in the sense I, pre, uh, I described a bit earlier. So the next slide, please, Ben. <clears throat> One can then actually group these sort of many, many sort of areas, these 370 areas into sort of settlement types. And this is what these two graphs do. And this is 81 to 2018, uh, indexed back to 100. So we can divide these areas into London, of course. Then we have the core cities. These are the big 10 self-proclaimed core cities provincial capitals in many way of the UK. And there are other cities right down to towns, small towns, and indeed uh, rural areas. And this gives a very good indication of the sort of pulling apart of, of the landscape, the economic landscape of the UK over this period. And what's interesting about the left-hand one, employment, you can see in fact that the cities, particularly the core cities, the, that's the yellow curve, uh, have really been growing much more slowly than the national economy in terms of employment being left behind. London was part of that group until the sort of mid nineties. And you can see since then, it's actually benefited very much from employment growth and pulled ahead and almost caught up in terms of punitive growth to some of the, the smaller towns and areas. But it's mainly, mainly small towns and villages that have grown particularly fast in terms of employment, not, not the cities, which is very different from the United States, I might add. The right-hand graph gives you the same thing for labor productivity. And here it's, it's almost the reverse. Uh, it's London and the, some of the cities that are growing fastest in productivity. The core cities haven't kept pace with London. They're more like the sort of large towns. And then the rural areas have got the slowest growth of productivity. So you've got an interesting, say, asymmetry in terms of the makeup of growth as between employment and labor productivity. Next slide, please, Ben. This gives the picture for productivity, which is a, a source of recurring concern for the UK government and indeed on a wider global front, the slowdown of productivity 
in recent decades. And the reasons for that are very complex. And we can't go into the, those here. The, the map on the left hand, left hand side gives you a picture of productivity levels. That's some um, output per worker, again, in terms of quartiles. And you can see there again, you've got this patchwork pattern of, of quite pronounced differences between different areas. It tends to be the cities and the larger towns that have the highest productivity levels. And you can see there very much that uh, peripheral areas, coastal areas, northern areas tend to have much lower productivity. And the right hand graph <clears throat> plots up the, the pattern in 1981, uh, 1980, uh, no, sorry, 1981, as against the pattern in 2018. And you can see there with the GB average as shown as well, that the, the high proportion of northern localities are concentrated in that lower bottom, bottom hand left hand quadrant. So these are the areas which are low productivity, many of them in the north, and they've remained there. So the position is a relatively static one, not totally correlation of 0.65, but a high degree of consistency over time. Whereas many southern areas, that's the red dots, are, are in fact in the, the upper right hand quadrant. So you've got this distinct pattern and it tends to be a reasonable degree of persistence in it, which of course is part of the, the policy problem. Next slide, please, Ben. Um, but, uh, and one should actually make something of this, London is itself uh, a city of two hearts. It's not an entire uh, sort of prosperous success story. And what we've done here is, is taken all the local authorities in London, these are the boroughs, 32 of them, and plotted up the cumulative employment growth left-hand side relative to the nation, and the, the cumulative output growth relative to the nation on the right-hand side. And you can see in both cases, there are a number of boroughs, particularly in terms of output growth, which in fact have lagged behind the national average. So if in a way they are part of the problem, which you also find in Northern Britain. So the left, ahead, left behind problem is one which has a regional dimension. It has a sort of settlement type dimension, but it also in a sense can be seen even in London itself. So the, the question is, uh, what's been behind this? <clears throat> and the book moves on to try and examine some of the causes. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I don't think Peter's been able to join us, so I'd better carry on and um, step up to the plate. Uh, and oh, yes, I have. Yeah, oh, I'm... excellent, excellent. Oh, here he is. Well, I'll hand over directly to Peter. Okay, thank you. So uh, in the book, we've looked at um, some of the... Um, proximate causes of these uh, patterns that uh, Ron's been outlining. Next slide, please, Ben. And what we've been doing is looking at so the post-industrial transition, the decline of manufacturing, the growth of services. Um, and we found this combination of regional, urban, rural, and local effects, which Ron has just been uh, mentioning. Many areas of strong manuf manufacturing employment decline have not seen offsetting growth in services employment. And um, this is interesting for uh, a number of reasons, but uh, what it does do, I think, is reveal some of the fundamental basic reasons why there are these patterns in people's livelihoods and well-being across the country. Some of the results are quite surprising. We find that kids and other services, certainly outside of London, have grown faster away from large urban centres. So there is a distinctive urban problem in the patterns that we find. This shift away from urban centres, however, has been quite selective, so it's discriminated against certain categories of place. So industrial towns, heavy engineering centres and coastal areas stand out as um, not um, joining in this, this growth of services that other places have seen. And what we argue in the book is that place specific effects are key, reflecting the quality of residential and urban environments. Okay. So here's the decline of production employment. It's probably something which we're familiar with already. We've seen the decline of manufacturing um, happening to a fastest degree in the core cities and in London. Production and employment includes manufacturing, uh, energy, utilities, and mining. And here you can see the pattern when we look at it across these settlement types. Okay, next slide, please, Ben. However, when we look at the patterns in the service sector employment growth, they're more surprising. And often these patterns are more often assumed and discussed rather than carefully examined. And when you do carefully examine them, the, the patterns are, are interesting. So on the left-hand side, you've got the growth of knowledge-intensive business services. 
And this is simple indexed growth back to 1981. And you can see over this longer period, there has been a faster growth in smaller settlements. You've got a clear hierarchy with problems. Surprisingly, in other cities, core cities, where the rates of growth in knowledge intensive business services have been lower than what we would expect. Now, of course, these are rates of growth. If you look at London's share of this total growth, it's large, it's about a quarter of the total growth in KIBS. But if you look at the other cities, their shares of growth in services are also surprisingly low. On the right hand side, we've got the other sector, which includes all the parts of the economy. Um, apart from kids and production, and it's dominated by other services in retail, wholesale, and, and so on. And here you can see this hierarchy in settlement types is even more marked, so an even weaker performance in urban areas uh, across Britain. And you can see the faster growth has been in the smaller settlements. So there is this, this, this hierarchy in settlement type which is affecting these patterns of post-industrial transition. Next slide, please, Ben. However, of course, there's this strong regional pattern as well. So these two slides are uh, very revealing because they show this hierarchy in settlement types, but they compare uh, the north and the southern regions. So you can see you've got a similar hierarchy um, in both uh, the north and the south, but the performances are um, greatly contrasting between these two sets of regions. So if you look at the north, for example, you can see that the, um, the, the smaller settlements, the villages, rural settlements have kept pace with the national rate of growth, but the other areas have lost uh, ground on the national rate of growth. They've fallen away from the national rate of growth. In contrast, in the south, you can see that most settlement types have been above the national rate of growth, which is here plotted uh, on the horizontal axis. So there's a regional dimension as well, which Ron has already mentioned. Next slide, please, Ben. Now we use the dynamic shift share to look at the causes of this. And what this reveals is that it's really place uh, competitiveness effects. It's not industrial structure, it's simply in terms of the composition of industries, which is driving these results. What stands out from this graph is the negative competitiveness residual effects in the urban areas. London obviously benefits some positive effects from its industry structure, but across the urban areas, there are um, negative competitiveness effects, which we need to take seriously and uh, explain further. Okay, Ben. Of course, we haven't just looked at employment change, and we've been thinking about the ways in which there are reinforcing processes around um, employment change, which make these dynamics cumulative and uh, lead to greater entrenchment and, and, and hardening of these problems seen in left behind problem, uh, places. So if you look at this set of bottom 74, the bottom quarter local authorities, and you look at their population, their population dynamics are quite different. So the graph on the left shows their population dynamics, and you can see that London and other cities have grown in terms of population, even though they've struggled uh, these areas in terms of their economies. But the other types of left behind place have really had stable or, or virtually no population growth over the period. And the big reason for that, of course, is they haven't benefited from net international migration. So there are different types of left behind areas with different population characteristics. But another set of cumulative dynamics, of course, is around skills. So, so if you compare this skill graph at the bottom here, which shows the share of employment in high skilled occupational groups, it's very similar to the productivity graph. It shows a lot of stability in the distribution over time, but it also shows that some southern areas are uh, increasing their lead in terms of high skilled occupations. These southern hotspot areas seem to be moving away uh, from the rest of the pack. So finally, to, to summarize, Ben, if I could have the next slide, just that there are very different types of uh, left behind places that we've discussed in the book, and they're made up of these patterns, these layered patterns in employment change. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, my, my session is looking at uh, lessons from 
past spatial policy in the UK, um, as many people here are, are listening to the video, uh, Zoom today will know, um, there's been many policies that um, governments around the world have used to tackle spatial imbalances, and the UK has been no exception. Um, ben, if I could have the next slide, please. Now, in fact, in the United Kingdom, we have a, a, a very long tradition of uh, seeking to address spatial imbalances. And um, when we began this work a few years ago to start looking at the various uh, policies that have been applied, um, we looked uh, intensely at the work of the World Commission on the Distribution of the Industrial Population. Uh, and indeed, the key work here is the Barlow Commission. Uh, we dug this out the vaults of Cambridge University Library. And as you can see, um, Sir Montague Barlow uh, was passionate about his concern about um, spatial imbalance in the UK. I don't think this slide could say it any clearer. Uh, and I would rec recommend reading the Barlow report to anybody. It, is, it pulls no punches. Uh, in its arguments as to why it is not uh, helpful for the UK to have high degrees of spatial imbalance. And so, um, to state the obvious, um, some 80 years on here now, um, it's a long running story. Uh, ben, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, now, much of the post-war uh, regional policy model that was applied, certainly for up till the early 1980s, was indeed largely based on the Barlow Commission report. Uh, and regional policy tended to be basically diversionary. Uh, it was very much concerned to steer activities, especially manufacturing, from uh, southern areas um, to the assisted areas, as they were called. Um, the map of assisted areas expanded considerably over time, up until the end of the 1970s, as the uh, torrid nature of Britain's deindustrialization actually led more areas to fall into the category of needing assistance. Um, then the map, of course, in the Thatcher years onwards became a lot more localised and fragmented. Now, urban policy really started to become a lot more important from the 1980s onwards, and it was very much focused on inner city um, regeneration to start off with uh, and housing and neighbourhood renewal, and it had a very strong property uh, element to it. Uh, ben, if I could have the next slide, please. Well, we've, we've looked uh, over the years, we've looked at all the various policies and uh, tried to identify what seems to be consistent evidence on what people might regard as weaknesses of the policy approach that the British government has applied. I think one of the crucial things that stands out very, very clearly is the complete lack of recognition of the sheer scale and importance of the problem. In fact, um, it does seem as though and there's been very little appreciation in any decade of just how big the problem is and what level of resource commitment and intervention would be required to address it. Therefore, insufficient resources have been committed to the problem and there's been a lack of a real strategic vision uh, as to what a spatially balanced economy would mean and uh, what a holistic view would, 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 would be if you were gonna take that view. Um, there's been a, a and crucially, as it's a reoccurring theme, I think, in our book, there's a, a real failure to integrate regional policy and spatial policy in general with mainstream policy thinking. And since mainstream spending, of course, dominates what the government spends, then therefore, in that sense, the spatial policies have always been very much um, second best. Um, we observe very clearly, looking at successive decades of intervention, that uh, policy has tended to be relatively over-centralized, top-down approach, um, and often a, a, a very strong emphasis on one size fits all, um, uh, with a, a disruptive churn of policy as well. And of course, the excessive, or the rather extensive focus on central government delivering and some years designing the policies uh, has meant uh, that in general, um, local capacity to develop local policy making has tended to obviously not be able to develop as much as it, it, it really needed to. Next one, please, Ben. Um, so um, here is uh, an estimate, really our estimate, of what we think has been the sorts of money that government has spent on urban and regional policies. Now, I think this might be one of the most heroic um, applied accounting exercises I've ever in, indulged in with colleagues, um, but we have actually uh, sought to piece together over the decades what uh, uh, HM Treasury has put into this policy, these sets of policies, both urban and regional. 
Um, I'd have to uh, put large bandwidths on this, but in general, it seems that with the government over the period from roughly the beginning of the 60s through to 2020, probably spent something in constant prices, uh, about 175 billion. Uh, that's roughly speaking about three and a half billion per annum, uh, or about 0.15% of 1% of a cheap gross national income. Now, um, from the mid 1970s onwards, EU funds started to uh, put resource into this issue as well. And we estimate um, that that probably added about another um, 1.4 billion per annum. Um, and overall, when you put the two together, um, the amount, total amount of money being devoted to this particular problem is probably never been more than about a quarter of 1% of gross national income. This compares with about um, 14 and a half billion that was spent um, on international aid in 2019, that's 0.7% of gross national income. And then of course, if you look at other countries and most notably the German Aufbauhaust building up East Germany program, they have um, put in 2 trillion euros since 1990. And we think that's about 55 billion per annum. Ben, if I could have the next slide, please. I mean, we won't go into this now, and we, we look more at this in the book, um, but you can just see, I mean, governments just love coming up with new policy measures um, to tackle this problem, uh, these problems. And this just gives you a flavour from the early 1980s onwards, the, um, the sheer scale of new policies, both regional and local and urban, um, they, they, they just keep coming out. Um, and, and often very little, as we've argued, coherence to the basic underlying thinking and the model. Then the next one, please. Um, so um, in general, uh, I think when we look back at um, policy, we've been very concerned, uh, keen, sorry, to, to try and understand um, what type of spatial policy has actually been in place. Has the policy been um, typically top-down spatially targeted, where central government has largely pulled most of the levers in both the uh, design and delivery? Have they been more place-sensitive, um, with a strong central government element, but of course local differentiation in which areas get what, the idea of clubs or places? Um, or have they truly been, um, and lots of new literature on this, of course, which RSA and others have um, have, have put out there, uh, have they been truly place-based and have they therefore really paid from a more bottom-up model uh, of delivery? So finally, uh, Ben, if I could have the last slide, uh, what are our lessons here from um, at least 80 years of British policy endeavour? Well, I think, first of all, one would admit that um, there's been a lot of good things done. So regional policies, for instance, did create jobs in the assisted areas, and they did improve the economic base of the areas in which they were targeted in many cases. Urban policies, it's very hard to imagine what would have happened without them. They have helped to regenerate many areas, especially many inner city areas, including London. But the sad fact, and I think the analysis that um, Ron pointed to at the beginning spells out clearly, in too many uh, left behind places, there's been no significant turning round of the development trajectory. Uh, and this means that therefore the problem of considerable spatial imbalance not only has not gone away, but in fact has continued to become more substantial. Um, as we argue in the book, much past spatial policy has been insufficiently place led and bottom up. The past, past policies have been relatively underfunded. They've certainly been inconsistent. And in some periods, actually, for instance, urban and regional policy have been playing against each other uh, in, in some, some of the decades. They've been inadequately tailored and adapted to needs of different local economies. But a crucial and a central problem has been the sheer lack of integration of spatial policy with mainstream policy. In fact, mainstream policy has often undermined spatial policies, what we call in the book counter regional policies. Thank you. OK, thanks very much, uh, Pete and Ben. We can move on to section four now, which is really uh, about trying to identify several ideas for the way forward and what might be needed for uh, effective policy uh, for levelling up. Uh, and in brief, uh, we can touch upon these. Um, next slide, please, Ben. Uh, 
We've got seven areas. Uh, we'll go through each uh, very briefly and just flesh out a little bit. There's a lot more detail and substance in the book that you can uh, engage with, but just for outline purposes for this presentation and to try and stimulate some further discussion and debate, uh, we've got these seven areas. Uh, if we move to the next slide, please, Ben. The first one we feel is the importance of grasping this transformative moment that we're currently in. Ambition and scale are needed in the unique setting now of a post-Brexit, hopefully post-pandemic recovery in the UK, uh, to really meaningfully address geographical inequalities. And there's an awful lot of inspiration we see in the US and President Biden's plans, uh, and in particular, their place-based policy elements. Uh, and there's been some excellent work by the uh, Brookings Institute on their Cities and Regions program, which has been looking at the extent to which uh, elements of those gargantuan uh, spending plans in the US then have been actually uh, focused through place-based type policies. So that's the first one, grasping a transformative uh, moment. The second one, uh, and again, this has been the, the substance, uh, I think, of Pete and Ron's blog, really, was trying to establish this much clearer and binding national sort of mission-oriented strategy for levelling up. Uh, part of this, I think, is we're inspired by the way in which the net zero commitment, which is legally binding, of course, in the UK, has been uh, quite important in setting the direction, the kind of destination of travel, if you like, for such a mission. And we're wondering whether such uh, a levelling up type mission could be formulated for the UK to embed this kind of longer term, much more focused, cross-governmental uh, kind of uh, mission where wider civic and private sector action and government action could be brought together to uh, address this uh, persistent and long-standing problem of geographical uh, inequalities. And we outline a number of pillars. I won't talk about them now. We don't have time uh, in the book that can uh, might be part of uh, that kind of uh, mission. The third one then, Ben, please, um, is as Pete's just described there to try and address some of the shortfalls of uh, the way in which too much of the history of spatial policy in the UK has been dominated by this highly centralised, top-down uh, national approach and really trying to move forward into a more decentralised context where we have bottom-up as well as top-down approaches. Uh, we really explore the importance of these uh, different kinds of place-based approaches that we distinguish in the book and meaningfully try and tailor the different mixes of policies then to the particular development needs of places. Uh, the left behind problem in Hackney and Hartlepool was not the same uh, and therefore doesn't require uh, off the shelf responses from uh, a centralised national government. Next one, please, Ben. The fourth one is really, and again, this is an old chestnut uh, concern, you might argue, amongst the people concerned with uh, local and regional development and governance in the UK, is really the need to try and decentralise and devolve and move towards a much more multi level federalised policy within the UK. Uh, the UK is amongst the most highly centralised governance systems uh, internationally. Levelling up to reduce these geographical inequalities can't be done by pulling levers in Whitehall in London in a very national uh, top-down way. Um, we'd just be repeating uh, history as Pete's just described in a previous section. There needs to be a substantial, meaningful decentralisation of powers and resources uh, across the piece. Perhaps a question of levelling up as well as filling in uh, a lot of the kind of governance uh, patchwork that we experience, particularly in the English context within the UK. And if a long term vision can be put in place uh, to try and move the UK towards a more decentralised and federalised political economy, this might give us a better chance of trying to break this long standing connection we seem to have between highly centralised governance and high levels of geographical inequality. Next one, please, Ben. The fifth point, and this goes hands in hand with decentralised governance, is trying to strengthen subnational funding of financing models. Uh, resources go hand in hand with the new forms of decentralised governance that we argue are important. And subnational funding of financing models need to be substantially strengthened, uh, both in terms of the kind of existing tried and tested instruments we list at the top of this table, right the way through to newer, more innovative uh, approaches. And there's some discussion in the book about new, the numerous possibilities that might be explored in this particular context. Next one, please, Ben. And sixth, and again, Pitts made this point uh, uh, as a critique of existing uh, approaches, but it's really try, uh, a very important um, task. And perhaps this um, is, is really fundamental, the idea of embedding geography much more into the national state and policy machinery. Uh, we recognise that national government departments with responsibility for spatial policy expenditure are relatively small in the context of national government. And there's a need for the larger, perhaps less geographically sensitive departments to improve their spatial awareness. 
departments that have the big budgets, welfare, health and social care and education, the big blue uh, dots on this, um, on this figure, uh, are really have the most potential uh, to contribute and make a difference to levelling up. Or if the opportunity is amiss, perhaps levelling down, as has been suggested by some uh, commentary. And finally, please, Ben, we argue that as, as part of moving into a more complex, uncertain, geographically differentiated setting for spatial policy, there's a great need for improved capacity at both the national and subnational uh, levels in government for strategic research, intelligence, monitoring and evaluation. This has become more important, we would argue, in the context uh, that we currently sit. And important here is learning the lessons, perhaps, from some of the existing work that's been done, uh, adapting it to local circumstance um, and building upon the experiences of the likes of um, Greater Manchester and the Mayoral Combined Authority and using evidence uh, as part of policy making. That's the end of this section. I'll pass over now to uh, Ben, who can now control his own slides and wrap this talk up then into a seamless whole. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, no, no need to prompt myself to do the slides. Um, okay, so my pleasure to um, to round up the session, a presentation looking at prospects and um, progress. So uh, we'll start off looking at um, kind of where we go from here. Um, then a few thoughts on, on kind of metrics, how to measure leveling up. Um, views from other studies are already included on, on how to do this. Um, some thoughts on the whole issue of time horizon and the long-term nature of the problem. And then some final thoughts on um, the kind of political, political economy, or should we say the constraints of, of leveling up the, the, the realities of it all. So um, firstly, in terms of uh, where do we go from here? Well, that's a burning question at the moment, isn't it? Um, uh, I've lost track of the number of delays of this uh, white paper. I think it might be up to three or four now. Maybe it's out mid-February, early February, we keep getting told. Um, but there's also rumoured to be a 10-point plan, um, but there's also rumours, no, I mean, not so much rumours about um, uh, discussions, so the least between Treasury and levelling up departments about funding, whether there's a risk that the whole thing is seen as a bit of a luxury with other pressures such as cost of living, inflation and such like looming at the moment. Um, and and the, the second two or the next two bullets to taken together really, the whole thing, um, the sheer scale of it, the cumulative long-term interrelated reinforcing nature of um, the inequalities that the UK faces uh, really mean that uh, the radical radical policies are needed, uh, as described by Andy and others in the book. Uh, and it's just interesting to me that the whole thing has become institutionalised. And uh, not so long ago, um, we started doing a paper on comparing uh, the UK divide to uh, North South Italy. More recently, it's been described as East West Germany. I mean, where do you go from there in terms of how how that just becomes part of the common discussion, and it's almost accepted. That that's the way things are um, but we think it's important that the whole issue is not just seen as economic um, economic factors are often seen as the easy thing the outcomes um, to look at but it's it, it, it's more than that it's definitely political um, it has to be um, also to do with the way that we govern our economic uh, and social systems so it goes very deep to the core of what the uk is about ultimately um, but, well, what do you, what do we mean about the metrics? Well, um, it still comes down ultimately to how you're defining what levelling up really means and the risk that this, as others have said before, um, remains a slogan without a policy. Um, what should the metrics be? Well, in the book, um, we make it clear that the whole issue is uh, multifaceted, multidimensional. There's no single metric you can look at. You could also look at it from other ways in terms of the inputs, the outputs and the outcomes. Uh, outcomes are often easier to measure than the other two, because uh, if, if you look at the earlier as aspects of it, then you need to understand how it all works and how it all interrelates and fits together to understand that. Um, but an open question here, maybe a discussion later, do we really want or need another kind of massive scoreboard monitoring system that there used to be in the past with um, previous um, regional agencies to, to measure progress. Is, is that the way forward? Um, 
clearly there should be uh, a mix of criteria across um, all aspects, not just not just the economic. Um, and this really means that it's it's hard to boil it down into some kind of single composite index that would give us a, a measure of progress. I don't think any of us are writing the book really, really would advocate that. It, you've got to look at all aspects and some areas are stronger than on, on some metrics than others. So it, it, it's a complex problem. Um, absolute or relative? Well, um, relative to what? Depends how you're defining leveling up. UK average would be the obvious one, but there may be other, um, uh, other relativities to think about. Um, the time horizon I'll, I'll come on to um, in, in a slide or two. Um, as to the centrally defined locally based criteria, well, um, things are likely to be centrally defined, but I think, you know, we, I think we all think that um, some more locally based criteria and targets would be, um, would be useful in this context, particularly if power is being devolved to these areas and make them more accountable. Um, for the funds they're for the funds they're spending, perhaps something along the lines of more kind of surveys of the local populations in these areas to judge whether they think um, their local environments and opportunities are improving, rather than a more remote, cold measure like productivity or, or real wages might be useful as well. Again, open question for debate. Um, in terms of um, views of our own own study and others. Uh, of how you might view the metrics. Well, I've grouped them into three broad categories, which are not mutually exclusive, obviously. Um, to start at the more cynical end of, uh, of, of the spectrum, you could say leveling up is, is really about the Conservative Party just retaining its red wall seats. And that's really all it's about. Um, you could broaden that to, to uh, kind of pol politics of belonging and discontent and trying to uh, make society more cohesive. Um, most studies obviously are included to some extent focus on the economic side of things, uh, looking at the easier to measure aspects. I say easy, but you know, grabbing the database is not easy. Um, things like real wages, productivity, and a lot of studies are focused on good jobs, um, you know, uh, by which they mean numbers of jobs and, and high real wages, productivity. But it's also skills, occupations, training, access to city centres, infrastructure, finance and, and obviously the government spending that's uh, allocated to this. Uh, and on the social side, um, sometimes harder to measure, um, sometimes seen as a bit more temporary when it comes to things like high street, um, high streets and, and, and civic pride. But there are also links to longer term agendas such as net zero, which could be taken, um, taken advantage of. Boosting institutional strength at local levels, uh, having seen them depleted over so many years of austerity. Uh, an abolition of regional agencies, uh, and also fundamental outcomes such as life expectancy and, um, and well-being. So, um, an alternate slide on the time horizon issue. Um, the speakers before me have, have, have all um, reinforced these points. Um, Levelling up is a, is, is a cumulative force um, that's been building over decades, and um, therefore the policy cannot be a one-off thing. It has to be long-term in nature. Um, the fact that it takes time means that um, such a policy really has to be institutionalized or constitutionalized so that it, as it is in Germany, but then, you know, have a written constitution there. So, um, it, but it, it really has to go to the bedrock of what we're trying to do. And it cannot be seen as more window dressing or an optional extra to bring in now and again. Um, and so, the logic of this requires is that it requires a cross-party commitment um, and um, shouldn't just be a metronome according to the political cycle or even as we've seen more recently with the abandonment of uh, industrial policy a cycle within the party um, so that policy even shifts dramatically um, with the same with the same flavor and color of politics um, and uh, yeah ultimately uh, we, we have to avoid this churn that we've seen in the past um, be flexible and adaptable, but um, be consistent and have a common uh, agreement to it. Final, uh, final thoughts um, take me back a little bit, um, a, a few years to when I was in Leeds uh, for the launch of the um, UK 2070 Commission uh, report, where Michael Heseltine um, was uh, giving a keynote session and he was 
lauding lauding the contents of the book uh, but his um his main message was well best of luck in getting that through um and what he was referring to there of course were the obstacles and constraints which face any um any report such as this such as ours uh with, with high ambitions uh and what 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 remains you know the question is what remains in place what will not change um outside of uh the report and therefore what is more likely to happen as a result of those forces remaining in play and i put three here which i think are quite critical to partly the state we find ourselves in um and how much will these change in the future to allow the policies and the and the ideals of what we would like to happen to actually take place the first is obviously um uh, the, the financial system, um, both the private sector where you have private equity firms um, channeling funds uh, back towards London and uh, basically impoverizing um, areas outside London and those uh, in dire need of leveling up. Uh, on the policy side, public size, you've got the purse strings, you've got, uh, as we have latest incarnation, Go versus Sunak, and the limitations are clear that there's no new money available for leveling up. It's all the kind of recycling of existing funds, um, as well as the, the old chestnut of the treasury, the equality versus efficiency argument, uh, which never seems to go away. Um, moving across the over centralization, partly linked to that, how much uh, is the government willing, central government willing to trust and release powers to local areas? How far? will devolution, devolution and related powers go to allow this ability to control their own future to really happen. And finally, again, going probably back even further than the other two, this whole adversarial uh, bi-party, possibly class-based still political system means you'd never have a long-term consensus or, or commitment to policy that transcends more than a five-year period. And even with same political parties as we've said, you know, you get changes of policy. So um, without this longer term overarching all party agreement, um, you know, you've just got something that can be ripped up by the next parliament or the next leader. And um, we, we, you know, we saw that with industrial policy. And so without that in place, again, what, what can really change? So um, a bucket of water to end things on, <laughs> but uh, raising some interesting questions nonetheless for hopefully for um, some, some questions and debate. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, um, Ben, and, and to all our speakers, I think you'll all agree that's just been such a rich and insightful analysis of what's a really thorny and um, persistent issue. So a huge thank you for, for capturing such a lot in, in such a short um, space of time. And yeah, that was the rain on the parade, Ben. But uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no good good comments. Um, we've got quite a lot of questions in the in the Q and A, so I'll do my very best to get through as many as possible. We may not have time, of course, to cover everything, but what I'll try to do is perhaps, if possible, group some of the questions under sort of um, themes so that we try to get through as much as, as possible. And I'll probably, with each question, maybe ask one of the panel to speak, but you may wish to, of course, all chip in or, or you know, feel free to say if you want to, to add uh, to, to another response. Um, so I think I'll start perhaps with a question um, from John Goddard, which was about relating to the analysis. I mean, really interesting and really detailed analysis of the of the kind of interrelated and over, you know, the layering processes in, involved in, in this in this levelling up um, issue. And John asks, what's the role of mobility of skilled labour, especially graduates, in underpinning regional divergence? And, and can that be influenced by policy? Um, so I don't know who would like to take that. Maybe um, Pete Sunley, perhaps, is that one for you to pick up? Yeah, I mean, it's obviously a key element of um, what we found. I mean, we didn't look in uh, detail at uh, graduates. We looked at occupational structures and we looked at, you know, the um, um, 
the creation of high skill jobs and occupations in different places. So I think other people will know more about the details of graduate movements. But obviously, I think it's, it, you know, this is part of the problem, isn't it? And these skill deferentials are um, the availability of skilled jobs are pulling graduates to certain areas. We know the, you know, the pull of London for graduate labour. We know that other places struggle. And also, you know, looking at the population movements, I mean, most of the left behind places that we're looking at, these bottom 74, you know, have got very weak um, uh, sort of domestic migration. So it's not just skilled labor that's reluctant to move to those areas. It's, you know, all, all, you know, all, all sort of, you know, occupational groups. So it's, it's a broader problem. But yeah, I think you're right, it's a key issue and it needs um, more attention and more thinking about how policies might do that. But of course, this skill problem is always very difficult, aren't they? Because we need to work both on the supply side and the demand side at the same time. And it's the coordination between those two, which I know Anne Green and other people have argued is you know, the, the key issue and where policy has again been lacking. So yeah, I'm sure it's a key issue and I'm sure other people will know more in detail about it. Could I just just sort of um, reinforce those points? I, I think, John, it, it, it is absolutely crucial. It's played a, an enormous role over several decades, the sort of net drift of highly skilled and educated people from northern areas, peripheral areas into the southeast and particularly London. Uh, in 1919, Halford Mackinder, in his book on democratic ideals, has a very interesting section on London. He was talking about London acting as a great sucking machine. It was sucking in the best talent, he said, from the rest of the country. So the problem in a sense is a long standing one. Um, and again, to, to pick up what Pete was talking about um, in terms of the, um, the, the commission work um, in 1940, um, there in that commission report too, the point is made of London sucking in the best financial, um, industrial and educational talent from the rest of the country. Now, one can overplay that, but I think we would all probably agree that I think London has had that pull, uh, particularly on educated labour. And of course, it's also the fact <clears throat> that um, there's a perception that huge incomes are to be gained by moving to London. And if anyone saw the programme last night on how the rich won the, lot, the decade after 2008 to 2018, on the salaries being earned by just quite standard banking personnel in London, it really is quite shocking. So I think we'd all agree with you, John. I think the role of the graduate migration has proved absolutely crucial over the decades. Just uh, one, one final comment. If um, the, the, There's two, I think there's two things here. There's the, there's the between areas and the within areas as well. I think um, Ron and Peter have covered the between areas. There's also a strong argument about lack of connection within places, urban places particularly, um, that don't allow the skilled labour to get to the city centre, the centre for cities. I did a study recently based on stuff by Tom Force at, at Leeds, showing how um, you've got you know these large suburban areas which have very poor transport transit connections and don't allow um, our second cities to really perform the way they should because they're not integrated. It takes someone too long to get in, and it's just. Um, there's investment there now this this could be any area it doesn't have to be a, a place that requires leveling up but you could argue probably quite convincingly that it's those areas that need most leveling up that have the poorest transport links um uh, and and most require the funding in that respect thank you that's that's a really mm. Response, I think, to gain a, a critical part of the of the challenge. Um, I'd like to move on to I think a number of questions have come in relation to devolution, because clearly one of the key arguments that you you make um, is that the the sort of systemic and persistent policy failures around uh, this this issue and the importance of a place based approach. Um, so perhaps I'll come to to Andy to to, to tackle some of these questions. We've got questions, um, for example from Sam Turner, Andy, about whether devolution is the best way to level up and what level should devolution be at? And perhaps 
a, a follow-up question from from John Walls, which is about the loss of powers and resources controlled at local and regional levels. So I wonder if you could say a little bit about, about that, please. Yeah, thanks, Jill, and uh, for the participants for their engagement and their, their very interesting and thought-provoking questions. Um, I think there's a, there's a general point perhaps first to make. Um, I think our view would be that the kind of governance institutions are, are key and they're kind of contributory rather than the kind of sole causal thing that can help with uh, dealing with the problems of left behind places. So it's no good, if you like, trying to get the institutional powers and resources in place if the economy is still struggling uh, in terms of skills or uh, structural gaps around innovation and so on and so forth, as the, the, the previous uh, uh, part of the presentation and the book shows. So I think it's, it's an important contributory um, you know, necessary but not sufficient, I guess the economist's uh, cliche would have it. So I think that's an important thing to say from the from the start um, on that. I think on the, the, the very interesting points about um, decentralization and devolution, uh, I think with that, I mean, you know, we would go for uh, and be aligned with the idea of subsidiarity, you know, devolving these powers and resources to the lowest appropriate levels, if, if that isn't too much of a European idea to cling on to in the uh, UK context these days. But of course, the problem being that we have an extremely messy map of governance across the UK. It's acute in England. Um, it's also present, you could argue, in uh, to a, a lesser degrees in Wales and uh, and Scotland and Northern Ireland too. And I think that's where there's a need for some pragmatism, really, in terms of moving this agenda forward. And as we put it in the book, levelling up and filling in, if you like, on this existing patchwork in terms of powers and resources and uh, subnational funding and financing models, these kinds of things, because you haven't got, a, you know, a tabula rasa, this empty field uh, to work with in terms of governance institutions, and you're not going to get kind of tearing it up and starting again type approaches from um, this or many other governments. So I think a degree of pragmatism, I think, is needed uh, uh, in, in that sense. I think politically as well, um, Ross Brown makes a very good point about the uh, potential cynicism then and how that kind of relates to the electoral fortunes uh, of this particular administration currently. Uh, I mean, arguably, you know, we read this um, uh, material about political realignment, uh, that we, you know, have a government that's attempting to try and knit together new political coalitions because the political geography of the UK has changed. So if we go along with that argument that... Um, uh, the current administration needs both red and blue walls in inverted commas um then how on earth are they going to uh, do that and the argument being that le uh, leveling up is going to be an integral part of that i guess we'll see the real weight and scale of that ambition and reality in dealing with those contradictions and tensions when the uh, this mooted white paper finally appears so thanks jill <clears throat> can i just just add something there i, I think the, there have been various versions of the white paper so it's rumored circulating within government departments. And one such version advocated a, a complete sort of overhaul of local government structures, because we do have a very complex system compared to many countries with parish right through to district, to county, to unitary and so on and so forth. And um, apparently that met with tremendous opposition from guess where? The association of local authorities from the, from the local level. So this is one of the big problems, I think. So I, I guess, the white paper is going to back off from that. From what I've heard, and others may have heard too, um, the likelihood is it'll recommend more of the sort of combined authority model. And uh, this will sort of not be rolled out totally nationally. There will be some, some more of those combined authorities, which you know may well be a viable model. The problem with all this, of course, if you, if you roll out these sort of um, experiments, which is essentially what they've been, to, to certain areas what do you do with the rest of the country it's like a doily you get these big holes in it you know what are they supposed to do in terms of government uh, governance and access to funds and so forth so there really is i think and i think all of us would agree on this is the leveling up issue is a leveling up of, of power and constitutional um, equality it's a sort of there's a constitutional element to this which has been messed about with and overlooked for decades and decades but i i think until you get that right or at least improved, then leveling up itself will always be compromised to some extent. So, you know, just to throw that into the, the discussion. Thanks, Ron, and thanks, Andy. Yes, really critical issues and, and really complex and challenging issues that you that you raise there. Um, thank you. Um, I'll move on to a question that um, Mike 
Crone has posed, which is, uh, I suppose, starting to think about um, looking at positive examples in the evidence that you've, that you've collated. So did the data work identify any examples of turning around or even closing the gap or arresting the decline, however we might describe it, at the sub-regional scale? Um, and if so, you know, do you have any insights from that on the relevant attributes of such places? Um, is there anything transferable? Who, who would like to, to take that one? Uh, well, I guess I'll kick off if you like, because it sort of relates, I guess, back to the, uh, the more empirical aspects of the, the book. Um, it's actually quite difficult to identify some really convincing examples of, if you like, turnaround. I mean, London is the shiny example because until around about the late 80s, um, it was deindustrializing as rapidly, if not more rapidly, in many other parts of the country. Because it was historically, as Peter Hall pointed out, so Peter Hall pointed out many decades ago, it was the main center of manufacturing activity in the UK in terms of sheer absolute numbers. So it, it suffered deindustrialization de as much as anywhere else. What it had, of course, it had other sorts of strings to its bow, which were meanwhile beginning to sort of take off, namely the whole sort of issue of finance. With the euro dollar market in the 60s and 70s, that began, um, if you like, to uplift the, the financial position of London. And of course, as globalization took place, um, the financial centers across the globe, London built into that. And you know, by the time you come to the Big Bang in 1986, which deregulates the financial sector nationally, but of course, much to London's benefit, then it really takes off in terms of turning around, in terms of growth and so on. Um, a, a turnaround, which of course then became problematic and uh, had a large part to play in the financial crisis of 2008, 2009. And if you wanna read about how, how suspicious London is as a financial center, um, read the books by Shaxon, um, because you get an insight there to effectively London owes its success, if that's what it is, to actually being an onshore, offshore financial centre, through which very dubious funds, as well as genuine funds, are channeled. You know, so even London, as an example of, turn, of turnaround, is not unproblematic. But if you look for other examples, um, you do find areas that previously were not doing very much before sort of the, the 1980s, um, my own area of Cambridge is one of those because up until the, the late, very late 1960s, 69 in fact, and then the particular 1970s, London, all it had was really just a few industries, not very, not dirty industries, the university kept those out. It had the university, but it, it didn't really grow very much, but then it began to take off in the 80s and particularly the 90s with all the science parks, of course. So if you call that a turnaround, it's certainly, um, take off you know so the area takes off from not actually being particularly fast growing into one which is a lot more dynamic but um other other countries have examples of turnaround but it is it is difficult to find some uh, in the uk i mean we we didn't actually examine each of the 372 local authorities for that perhaps that's something we might look at in the in in detail but it's an interesting question though if i might just come in there ron i mean i think mike to add two things um, first of all, one shouldn't underestimate just how much of the uh, turnaround of London was aided by spatial policy as well, which, yeah. of course, hasn't done much for the North-South divide. Um, the amount of resources that was committed, uh, albeit through uh, controversial policies at the time, but the amount of resources that was committed to um, getting Docklands and that new second financial services platform established, which has aided London enormously, um, has been very considerable indeed. I mean, not only direct urban policy, but also coming back to what we said about the need to harmonise with other forms of policy, um, the amount of resource that was put into transport. And in fact, where you see turnaround of that sort, it's where you see harmonisation of the spatial policy working alongside, in the case of Docklands, of course, um, although it is, of course, a controversial model, um, Docklands working <coughs> alongside transport and other major public uh, funding initiatives. So uh, I think one has got to say, of course, London has created within itself, as we said earlier, strong spatial division, but you do see very effective use of spatial policy when it is coordinated 
with uh, other policies. And um, the transformation of the sheer scale of activity now, uh, which has contributed to national growth as well in Docklands, is, is enormous over the years. I mean, there are other areas as well. And I mean, uh, I mean, another area which I would just point to, I think it's been quite successful again building on spatial policy has been Corby. Um, where, where the, these are areas which have turned around. Of course, the big issue is what would they otherwise have done? And have we really changed the trajectory that um, to bring them into a faster growth trajectory? And I, I think there are examples where um, more, that's what the point we're making is that the turnaround would have been quicker, it would have been faster and more established with the, with the uh, ingredients we've argued for. Yeah, <coughs> one could just point to some American examples. I'm thinking of um, um, old industrial cities like Pittsburgh and Akron, in the United States which de-industrialized very heavily in the, the 70s and 80s, uh, but both of which have undergone a bit of a renaissance in the last uh, couple of decades uh, around new sorts of industries, but also branching out of, of inherited skills and, and competencies. So, and again, in both cases, very strong local leadership and coalitions between business, the universities and other sort of stakeholders. So, it can be done, of course it can, but it does require concerted effort. But I think Pete's point about London is particularly pertinent because I see there's another question by John Walls. He says, a loaded question, why don't the panel believe that the market will solve the country's problems? Well, the market's had a century or whatever to actually solve the problem and it hasn't. Moreover, London's success is not due to purely the market as Pete has just rightly pointed out. It's been underpinned by spatial policy and a huge sort of public spending, infrastructure spending and other sorts of spending. If you look at many of the indicators on public spending on infrastructure or ed education, it actually is far more per capita than most other parts of the UK. So London is grossly underpinned by public spending. So it's, it's a nonsense to use that as some sort of free market exemplar, which the rest of the country should follow. So I think, you know, that might just, link into John Walls's question. Mm -hmm. could, I, could I just add on the turnaround? Well, that's yours, Peter. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I just want to add quickly on the turnaround question. You can look, look in all regions and you see there's a major difference between uh, local areas, uh, so, some of which have managed to do well by creating an attractive environment for post-industrial growth service industries. So some places have improved dramatically on the basis of attracting that um, post-industrial growth in all areas, but they tend not to be the areas with the old industrial legacies. They tend to be towns which are more connected, better rural, uh, better residential environments, um, where places where people want to live. And what stands out from the data is that places with the, you know, serious legacies from the past find it much harder to become those attractive environments for post-industrial growth. So, so I think that's a key difference in what we see in the data. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah, so, so it's exactly that. Places where people want to live and places where people want to raise a family. <laughs> Just, just to finish off all the comments, um, yeah, I mean, Pittsburgh, we, we did some stuff, I worked for Transport for the North a little while ago, and Pittsburgh was one of the clear um, examples that came up as somewhere that's transformed itself from a previous kind of industrial uh, decline, uh, which is something TFN were, were very keen on um, picking up on. And Ron's, Ron's mention of the um, European um, angle, we did again a study a cohesion fund study with ron a few years back now where we looked at the kind of um deciles of gdp per capita regions and um basically like a markov chain type analysis of the percent you know what chance have you given if you were in the bottom decile in 1970 who do you would you have of being in the top decile in, in 2015 with the answer is zero um but um what chance would you have of shifting across to a new state, to the next one up, and and re really, there's such just such persistence of of, of kind of um, if you're if you were low in the 70s, you're going to be low in the 2000s. That that retains its its pattern throughout. Um, but there are, uh, and we could we could and probably should do this for um, the UK uh, lads and, uh, and and the areas identified to pick out more easily those that have managed to transcend and leap across areas and, and follow through. That's probably for the sequel to the book, I guess. Hmm.
Great, thank you very much. You've set up a nice uh, future research agenda there, which is which is good. Um, we, I think you've tackled, I suppose, or touched upon some of the um, issues around comparative work. So perhaps I can skip over maybe those those questions. But there's an interesting kind of grouping of questions around, you know, what what's needed, what's the sort of solutions here, what are the radical or, or different approaches that are needed to tackle this issue. Um, so, for example, um, Dane asks about um, public expenditure and investment in infrastructure in universities. And um, what role do you see that sort of place specific investment having in uh, offsetting spatial disparities? And Emil and others have also asked about alternative economic development models. We know there's growing interest in the foundational economy, in community wealth building and so on. So I wonder, Andy, perhaps if you would like to take those questions on some of these alternative options that you think might present something of a solution. Yeah, thanks, Jill. And uh, hello to Emil. And uh, thanks um, for this question and, and the other questions around this. Yeah, I mean, what's heartening, I guess, in the kind of post 2008 uh, period is the emergence of lots of work building on this beyond GDP tradition of looking for alternative models. We don't really spend a lot of time uh, exploring that in the book, but certainly things like the foundational economy, the well-being economy, community wealth building are certainly attracting a lot of attention, particularly in their very localised forms that they've been emerging at the at the time. And I think our view would, um, would be that they've certainly got a role to play. I think we mentioned this in the... Uh, in the book, there's a need for experimentation with new approaches, a need for uh, scaling up, perhaps. Uh, but particularly, I think there's a need for monitoring and evaluation of whether and how they work or not, because I think we're at such a kind of early formative stage, I think, in exploring the, the value and worth for, uh, of these um, innovations and alternative approaches. And I think a lot of good work's been done in Wales, I think, in terms of thinking this through and the Welsh Government actually uh, having a a kind of foundational economy approach that they're willing to sort of put uh, public resources behind. So I think that's key. But tying it back to the main arguments in the book, I think one of the key things is having uh, places with appropriately decentralised powers and resources to be able to support, support such experimentation uh, in activities and tailoring these different alternative approaches then to what local and regional communities then might conceive as the kind of development needs that they have. So I think that's very important and ties it back into the book. I think on the there's some nice questions, I think, from Alex Garvey and uh, Alice Garvey, rather, and uh, John Battler on um, kind of net zero decarbonisation infrastructure stuff. I mean, clearly there are massive potential and, and you know, government um, seems to kind of perceive of infrastructure as a kind of silver bullet, I think, to try and address a lot of these uh, levelling up concerns, very tangible, concrete investments in, uh, in a very literal sense. And I think what we'd argue there is, is to try and ensure that these things are aligned, they're integrated, they're coordinated in such a way that national and subnational policies and spending around these, um, these kind of big national missions, if you like, are actually worked through and worked out so that you, in a sense, try and move strategy, policy and funding in the same direction. You know, and you don't have net zero over here and leveling up over here and hope that somehow the two kind of uh, coincide in certain places at certain points in time. So again, tying it back to the main arguments in the the book, this need for a much more geographically aware, I think, um, understanding uh, that can align, integrate, coordinate uh, the spending that's available and particularly trying to get those uh, not necessarily very geographical parts of government uh, thinking in more geographical ways. So thanks, Jill. I think to, just to add that, <clears throat> add to that, I think what we'd also probably agree on is, is that the public sector itself needs to be sort of rethought in terms of being a source of entrepreneurialism and innovation itself. I mean, I think that the pandemic has brought home just how important the health sector is in a wider sense in terms of its role within the economy, but also as a source of, of um, innovation and, and technological advance. And I think that's another thing, you know, one can look at um, the role that the public sector plays in the different regions and different localities. I and mean, if you take again, Cambridge with the Adderbrooks Hospital, if you, you visit Adderbrooks Hospital, it is a gigantic medical research center of, of incredible science. I mean, it's, it's reckoned that there may be 11 to 15,000 people employed just on the, the Adambrook, greater Adambrook site. And of course we've got AstraZeneca there now as well. And why does AstraZeneca want to go there? Because it can tap into the whole sort of medical environment that the Adambrook site provides. It can even trial drugs there apparently uh, through the hospital. It's all sorts of things that can go on within the public sector and the universities as well have a key role, I think, as I'm sure John uh, would, would actually agree with. 
You know, so I, I think rethinking the role of the public sector within growth strategies is also needed rather than always seeing the public sector as a problem. You know, it costs too much, it's got to be made more sort of cost effective or indeed over the last decade or more, it's a, it's a, a, a real case for cutting wherever possible. Whereas in fact, it can be a, a growth engine uh, for local areas, I think. Um, yeah, I think a kind of follow up question or connected question, maybe this is one for, for Pete, Tyler, because you did the really comprehensive um, analysis and overview, Pete, of the history of, 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 of spatial policy and approaches. And there's a question from Jack Shaw about the role of the civil service, again, perhaps, you know, within the public sector. Did you get a sense from your analysis of the role of the civil service on past policy themes? either being, for example, too London centric or having a lack of expertise or access to expertise. Um, and, a, and a related point, how do academics make sure their voices uh, are counted? So perhaps I don't know if you want to tackle that one, Pete. Yes, I mean, it's a fascinating question. And uh, I, I, I do feel that uh, the, the British model has been so much uh, Whitehall driven that of course the civil servants have responded to, to that model um, the uh, the Barlow report, of course, led to um, a very um, uh, substantial program um, policies designed to redistribute industry that were, was dominated by the Department of Trade Industry at that time. And of course, the civil servants responded to to that imperative. Um, uh, to me, um, the role of civil servants or, or any servants is is dominated really by where the money's coming from and where where the resources are to ultimately allow new ideas to be generated or whatever. And I think throughout much of the decades that one looks at British policy, it has been so dominated by the centre that it has inevitably been um, uh, very much influenced by civil servants at the centre rather than local government um, uh, uh, policy makers more. That has changed uh, somewhat, of course, over the decades. Um, the 1980s was probably the worst example of where um, top-down policies, one size fits all with a very much central uh, remit uh, tended to dominate. I mean, that was a, almost a lost decade. For, for that sort of certainly regional policy thinking. Although, of course, you always see innovative policies emerge. Uh, and they, you know, that a lot of those uh, have been, of course, done good things. Um, I, um, if you're going to allow local um, decision makers to develop local solutions to the transformative change that they wish to bring about, then you have to empower them, you have to give them resources and the capability to do that. And I just do not see that happening at the speed at which is required. I mean, colleagues will know we've just come out of an awful decade of austerity where local authorities have been cut back to the bone on um, their local economic development abilities. And it was only, of course, with the combined authorities beginning to emerge midway through the uh, last 10 years that, of course, some resource was put into those models. So um, I think one can't underestimate just how little resource has gone in to empowering the local level to actually do the things that are required. So naturally, it's been deterministic from central. Um, that model has to change if you believe that uh, local decision makers know what's best required to uh, influence local trajectories and economic growth. And I mean, obviously um, we see examples all the time of, of very successful public-private uh, models involving universities, the new captains of industry, et cetera, um, bringing about very successful change, but the rate of change, and this is our point in the book, has not been fast enough given the nature of the problem and empowering local decision makers has got to be a core part of our way forward. I don't know if that helps, um, Jill. Can I just add a, a comment to that? I, I think one of the key problems of, of the UK, and it's been there for decades, if not centuries, is the overwhelming power of the Treasury. And the, the fact that, that that power is linked to a total lack of a spatial imaginary. It cannot, it does not, doesn't want to think in spatial terms. You know, so there's, there's always a problem and actually you know, confronting if a department like Bayes or whatever comes forward with a policy, it has then to get in an argument with the Treasury over the funding of that. And the Treasury always, in a sense, has a, an argument that, you know, it's the national economy which matters and it's the financial system that matters. And if anything, I, it, it actually is it, extraordinarily perverse the way it works as well, because it, 
it often, in a sense, undermines what efforts are made at the local level to do things in terms of, for example, as Pete mentioned, the austerity program um, that uh, George Osborne uh, seemed to uh, celebrate in his, his um, involvement with last night on this program, which, of course, meant, you know, you, you bail out the London banking system, but then you penalise the regional public sector outside of London, particularly. You know, so there's this very strange sort of way in which the Treasury thinks about these things. And until we, re we actually impart some degree of spatial imagination within the Treasury, I think there'll always be this tug of war between various other departments wanting to do things, and then the Treasury always finds some excuse and some reason not to do them. Thank you, Ron. Yeah, big critical challenge there, isn't it? And that spatial Im imaginary and how that de develops. I mean, I, you know, it's such a, such a critical point. Um, we're, we're running up against our timeline, so just a couple perhaps of, of final questions. I think a couple of people have asked about the role of the private sector in particular in this. I mean, we've talked a little bit about the public sector um, and perhaps some tensions that, that might exist in, in relation to um, that, that issue in the levelling up agenda. Who would like to, um, to tackle that, that one? Yeah, I can... Um... If you like, Jill, I mean, yeah, there was a couple of questions. I think a very good one from uh, Lisa McSorley um, from Sunderland asking about the role of the private sector and trying to, you know, perhaps impart a geographical sensitivity upon the private sector investment decisions. And of course, this is a crucial part of it that uh, we've spent a lot of time, I think, in the book kind of, I guess, analysing the outfall of our uh, mostly uh, private mixed economy kind of works and plays out over the UK in terms of left behind places. But of course, one of the key things uh, we can talk about is policy and institutions in the public sector, but that critical role of the private sector in delivering on the investment, uh, on the job creation, good job creation, of boosting productivity, uh, even kind of co-financing infrastructure and so forth is a fundamental part of this. And I think lots more work needs to be done in terms of trying to find the mechanisms uh, of engagement for private sector and, uh, and particularly mobilising investment from pension funds, insurance funds and so forth for uh, for infrastructure and I know this new infrastructure bank is meant to be trying to do that I think our concern would be that it hasn't got a strong enough subnational uh, dimension to it um, so it might end up being uh, even though I think it's headquartered in Leeds uh, might be just another tool then of top-down uh, centralized national uh, policy so I think that's key and trying to as Lisa puts it then develop the geographical sensibilities then at a private sector I think it's a very worthwhile uh, uh, agenda the second point on the tensions I, I think as we've um, Kind of explained today in uh, in 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 a, a kind of brief uh, way. I think there is a fundamental tension at the heart of uh, this UK government's uh, uh, leveling up policy between these very long term structural issues about innovation, productivity, skills development, and so forth, which are you know intergenerational, huge scale, long term challenges um, for any government. You know, more akin to this kind of thirty plus year project in Germany for uh, dealing with the um, uh, the old east. And, you know, what seems to be these much more politically expedient short term, let's get elected in 2024 agendas, which is much more about, uh, I think Rachel Wolf called it the hanging baskets theory of um, boosting civic pride, having tangible things like tree planting and hanging baskets in places that are left behind to make them feel better and feel like this government's delivered for these red wall seats now. Those two things don't sit very easily together. Um, and the worry, of course, is how a, um, a, a white paper from this government then, amidst all that's going on, um, can actually try and hit the target of uh, producing some meaningful uh, proposals that are actually going to um, make some substance then of uh, the ambition of levelling up and uh, turn it then from a, a slogan into a policy, which is one of the fundamental things that we argue needs doing in the, in the book. Yeah, could, could I just add again another final comment there? <clears throat> It was very interesting when the government began to talk about wanting a levelling up agenda, that it immediately uh, actually led to a letter to the Financial Times signed by several tens of private sector companies headquartered in London, saying, you know, we don't want this because this will involve levelling down London, and that would be a disaster for not only London, but for the rest of the UK economy. So the idea of London as some sort of national dynamo on which we all depend, you know, it's very much, that. and also this idea of a zero sum mentality, you know, that raising the prosperity in other areas would necessarily pull down the prosperity of London. 
And I think, again, you know, this is, this is power in this case of the private sector. And there's now an organization which is monitoring extremely closely every government announcement to try and detect whether there exists in that announcement some indication of leveling down London. So there's, there's even an opposition within, you know, or, or tension even within the private sector itself. It depends where the private sector is, if you're, you, if, or if you're in Newcastle or whether you're in London, because the London sort of corporate elite uh, seem to me to be very opposed to leveling up. And they've made their voices quite, quite clear. So again, you know, it's, it's very, very complex, even within the private sector itself. But I think this idea of leveling down London, it may sound a, a purely theoretical idea, but in the conversation I was invited to by Gove and Andy Haldane um, around leveling up a few weeks back, Andy Haldane came up with precisely this theory. He said, what we mustn't do is do anything that level da levels down London. Again, this sort of zero sum mentality was really quite to the fore there. And I think that again is another obstacle to actually pressing ahead with a really sort of radical uh, leveling up policy. If I might just add one, one thing, Jill, I think it's very important that we understand that to be place this idea that um you know that in some sense there's there's losses from encouraging growth in other areas outside london is a, a complete misnomer um in answer to the question about the private sector uh, i think there's enormous potential for unleashing the private sector to work in partnership with the public sector uh, and there's just so much opportunity i mean the scale of the change required to make the uk the sort of place we want it to be and to level up within that and not on a static thing but in a dynamic way um is the scale of the problem the resource requirement is so great that it's going to require lots of new thinking about uh, how to involve the private sector and my I if they could just get some continuity in the way in which governments wish to go forward. So I think we should not see it statically. I think we should not see it as some sort of conflict. Uh, we should certainly stop the dominance of the public sector in spatial policy formulation. But crucially, we need to mainstream all government policy to the levelling up agenda. And that's a crucial message. Mm -hmm. That's a great um, and powerful message to, to end on. Um, I'd like to say a huge thank you to all our, our panellists for such an interesting and insightful analysis. You've really, I think, um, articulated very clearly the, the causes, the nature and the scale of the challenge that, that we face with the levelling up agenda. So a huge thank you to you. Thank you to all our participants as well for the really interesting and insightful questions. I'm sorry we didn't perhaps manage to get through everything, but um, perhaps if you read the book, you'll probably find that some more of the answers to your questions are, are there. And thank you very much to the RSA for organizing um, this, this session and uh, do keep an eye out for future events. Um, so and thank Jill. you very much, thank everybody. You, thank you very Take much, care. Jill. Yeah, thank you, Jill. Thank you. Thanks, Jill. Jill, Jill thank, thank you very you. much for your interview. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Goodbye. Everyone. Bye. Bye for now.